All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad it's Wednesday night again. <laughs> Made it through another week. That's impressive. Uh, welcome to folks who are coming for their who knows how many time. Welcome to new friends joining us. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective and our Well of Being evening. And yeah, this is just unbelievably precious opportunity to practice together. Uh, there was someone who joined us last week and uh, they shared with me, they don't often come to in-person classes and they, they were surprised that, you know, there's so much more capacity to just be in the meditation with other people and that is such a gift that we all give each other so thank you all for showing up and making that possible tonight we're going to continue uh, with this beautiful story and the historical life of the buddha and he is now 72 he's been you know awake more than 30 years teaching and um, at this point, it's interesting. A lot of the kind of stories are, as I've been mentioning in the recent weeks, they're they're revisiting these core themes, sometimes in a more nuanced way, sometimes in a more confusing way, to be honest. So I'm picking and choosing what we're going to share. Um, I wanted to start with kind of two quotes from this reading that we're going to cover tonight. And I thought we could revisit the practice we did last week of settling into those three precious pills, the stillness, the silence, the openness. People like that last week. That was it. It's very, it's very sweet and very subtle. And I do find the kind of repeating of it can be so helpful. So welcome, come sit anywhere. Yeah. And um, yeah, and just as a, a reminder and a little preamble on that practice, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, really amazing Tibetan teacher who we're so fortunate. He lives in the Bay Area, though he teaches all over the world. So he's rarely here. <laughs> Um, we'll be reading his book together in January. I have to really specify which one because I think he has like at least 20, if not 30 books. Pretty impressive. This is The True Source of Healing. It's a shorter book, but really beautiful book. And this is part of his core teachings is how do we settle into our practice? And it's very common in Buddhist teaching to have these three components. We want to settle our body, our speech, and our mind. The first one is pretty obvious, settling the body, right? The form body, the physical body, but what does settling the speech mean? Anyone? What does that actually mean? What does it mean to settle the speech? Yeah. The chatter. The chatter. Yeah. So the kind of everyday coming and going of the mind. Yeah. How's that different than settling the mind? Super tricky, right? Right. So if we if we settle the body into the quality of stillness, that's somewhat evident, right? There's a stillness. We're not not moving. And we're also kind of inviting or moving towards stillness as an opportunity. So that can be really beautiful. Yeah. My chatter reflects my mind. Beautiful. So if I can be mindful of my chatter. Yeah. I can benefit my mind. Yes. I'm going to repeat that for, for folks online. So chatter reflects the mind and to be mindful of the chatter, to be mindful of the mind, mindful of the chatter, mindful of the chatter then can help with settling the mind. Yeah. And it is, they are kind of nesting, right? The stillness of the body does help kind of have a stillness of the mind also just that stillness experience. And I do think this inner chatter, this inner narration, our goal with it is to have that quality of inner silence. That sounds like a really high bar. Has anyone here ever had more than 90 seconds of inner silence? <laughs> right? Maybe. Right. 
I mean, not even when we're asleep, right? You have to be even in when we bring awareness into our dreams, which I know there's some dream yogis here. We realize that there's a lot of chatter throughout our dreams when we have awareness into our dreams. So that invitation to silence doesn't mean there are no words, there are no thoughts, there are no memories or images. It's kind of what we're inclining towards. I'm inviting this quality of silence to that inner chatter. And then, you know, just as is beautifully described, once we're aware of that chatter, maybe almost naturally, the mind can feel more open. We're kind of settling or inviting the silence. And mind and consciousness is a lot more than just the chatter and thoughts. So that's why we kind of, we settle them in different or separate ways. Um, so when we settle the mind, we're settling far more than just the thoughts, memories, and images that are moving through. They're kind of all these aspects of mental formations, these subtle desires and subtle aversions. So really settling into this openness. And what Wangyal Rinpoche really beautifully describes when we're describing mind, we're describing heart. Right, So there's a kind of real overlap or real connection between both the heart and the mind. So when we're saying settling the mind into its natural state, we're settling the heart into its natural state also of openness. So that's um, the invitation. And again, in practice, often we're kind of pointing out these concepts or ideas like stillness. Stillness we can actually feel in the body, but of course the body is still moving, there's energies moving through us. But we're pointing out these kind of qualities and there's some part of us that kind of knows what that feels like, knows what it feels like to really settle, find stillness in the body and to find that kind of sense of silence with the chatter and the devices, of course, <laughs> optional. Because um, silence doesn't mean there's no sound, not only internal, but external also, right? Like the silence is, it's in some ways what we are choosing to put at the forefront of our awareness and attention. So are we choosing, right, to kind of orient towards the chatter or are we choosing that silence, the spaces between the chatter? It's kind of a way that we're preferencing our attention and our awareness. And then the openness can really, you know, it can kind of go on and on. There's no, there's no boundary. We could get a little bit of openness or we could get a lot of openness and we can allow ourselves to kind of ease into that. And last week, I uh, also invited us, having kind of settled the body, speech, and mind into these qualities, to notice what might be available once that is settled. Our basic goodness, this kind of sense of we are always already okay. That's our fundamental nature. And I think that's such a tough one for some of us to believe. We think we're good when we have done this. We're good if we have not done that. So this idea of settling into something that's not contingent, a goodness that's in each of us, not because we're at a Dharma class, right? But each and every one of us means that you're not special, right? In that it's not just you, but you're special in that like all of us have this intrinsic I really like thinking of it as like the inner gold because it feels that way. Like it's like this kind of sifting up to the surface of this beauty and this shining and this light. And again, that's a, those are concepts and words, but to notice if we can have access or feel that sense of inner gold once we've settled the body, speech, and mind. So that's where we will head. And I wanted to, to share just two little quotes. We'll get into it. But one is that the Dharma, the, the teachings, is a living reality. And it's so simple, but I, I really, I found that so beautiful. That these teachings, they're not just poetic words or nice stories, but a living reality within us. And that as much as possible, actually, even though I will be using words, go for the feeling. Go for the living reality of the experience of the Dharma. <clears throat> and then the other, and this is just a really a short, probably quite well-known um, little story or teaching of the Buddha. Um, 
he is talking, he has met one of the monks who has been living and dedicated himself to practice for a number of years. And before he was monk, he, he was a musician. And he would uh, not only play instruments, but he would create and, and fashion instruments. And the Buddha noticed that Sona, this monk, was giving too much effort to his practice. Not usually most of our problems, right? <laughs> but this monk was giving too much. He was like running himself ragged with practice. So he said, um, <laughs> Before you became a monk, you were a musician, were you not? You specialized in the 16-string sitar, didn't you? And he said, yes, that is correct. And the Buddha asked him, if you play the sitar while the strings are slack, what is the result? And he answered, if the strings are slack, the sitar will be out of tune. And what if the strings are too taut or too tight? The strings are too tight, the strings are more likely to break. And if the strings are just right, neither too slack or too tight, then the monk says, if the strings are just right, the sitar will provide fine music. Just so. If one is idle or lazy, one will not make progress in the practice. But if one tries too hard, one will suffer fatigue and discouragement. But this is also true, not only in our overall path of practicing meditation, but even in our meditation sit. So when we're practicing, we can easily, I know a lot of us here struggle with this, fall into that not very tight string, right? That lax feeling, kind of like a little too spaced out. Maybe it kind of feels good, but it's really mushy. That's like a little too slack, not, not enough tautness. And then we can also have that kind of like too many thoughts and too many tr trying a little too hard and, oh God, I'm not doing it right and too tight. Like how do we have that just right feeling? And I'm grateful that I can't read your thoughts. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on in your practice. And that is like such a wonderful, empowering part of practice. It's up to you. You have to be checking in. Like, do I need to release a little? Am I, am I like kind of too tight? Do I need to really refresh a little? So I think that's a really beautiful instruction for us. Any practice, this practice, absolutely. But any practice of tuning in with introspection and literally tuning our own instrument making those strings just right. So just a little inspiration there. Any questions about the practice, especially silence, stillness, and openness? Or anyone want to debate whether or not they have intrinsic goodness within them? So has everyone felt that at one time or another? Like, there's something, not because I did something good, but there's something good here. When we were kids, for most of us, that was a little more available. Not, not everyone had that opportunity, but that is truly our, our most deep nature, of feeling connected to that goodness. So if you are having a hard time finding it, you could even imagine yourself as a little being kind of that freeness, that openness, that joy before you had an identity and a role and a responsibility to be someone in this world. Okay, so with that, let's find a posture that will support you. We'll probably do about 24 minutes of practice or so. Welcome to grab a cushion, blanket, and I mentioned, I know, especially it's like so dark early these days. If you're feeling tired, you can always open your eyes during practice. Uh, you can always also stand up. It's something you can do, um, giving yourself that moment of kind of refreshing back into uh, your, your clarity by just having that standing up is totally an allowable 
Buddha approved meditation posture of standing as is lying down, but very hazardous this time of night. So not totally recommended. Taking a moment and just feeling a sense of connection with this physical place, whether here in the center or wherever folks are online. Feeling a sense of the floor beneath us, the walls around us. A sense of that darkened night sky, maybe still some lingering clouds. Feeling a sense of where we are in the seasons. Still in this deeper, darker part towards the solstice. You know, this cloak of dark evening all around us. And as we recognize the sense of place and land, season around us, we might more fully experience a sense of our body here in this space. Our body so perfectly designed to be right here between the sky above, held up by the earth below. Whether eyes are closed or just gently, softly focused, feeling a sense of the other beings gathered here, whether in the physical space here at the center or online, just this sense of community and gathering. Each of us here tonight represents such a wide and beautiful net of causes and conditions. So many ways that made it possible for us to be here in this moment. You 
really showing us that sense of interbeing and interdependence. And of course, we're already aware of the busyness of the mind. The unbelievable net and web of thoughts, memories, images, present, past, future. I'm inviting a stance that this is not a problem. This is just as natural as the feeling of being supported by the ground beneath us and the sky above us. And we can deliberately choose to redirect our attention and awareness <clears throat> away from what might be carrying us out of the present moment and then returning now more fully to attention and awareness in the body Bringing our mindful attention and awareness to the body with curiosity and kindness. And simply noticing the wide field of sensation in the body. Areas of sensation around the face, the chest and the belly. Allowing the attention and awareness to roam freely throughout the field of tactile sensation. Bringing attention and awareness to the body doesn't mean looking down on the body or scanning the body from the outside. 
It's a sense of knowing and feeling from within the body. Starting to have a sense of the periphery of the body. Maybe even the center of gravity dropping a bit from around the head into the belly. Maybe noticing that every time you get swept away by a thought, a memory, or an image, you're no longer in the body. Noticing, really rejoicing in the return. Re-inhabiting, saturating the body with our attention and awareness. Now inviting this first quality, maybe just revealing what might already be here of the quality of stillness in the body. Stillness because of course we aren't moving or going anywhere, but also this intention the settling in, the stilling of the body. Feel or imagine the body with that quality of stillness, like the mountain.
while still retaining this full presence in the body. We open up to this quality of silence. Referencing the silence over the chatter. Feeling the possibility of silence all around us. Again, not as the absence of any sound, internal chatter or outside sound. Just where we're resting our attention and awareness. This quality of silence. Feeling or imagining that quality of silence that naturally arises from stillness, like a very dark, still night, maybe outside of or away from the city. Noticing that quality of silence that just can envelop all around. And again, whenever we get caught up and carried away, just relaxing, releasing what has captured our attention and awareness, and noticing you know, how it feels to return to this choice of silence and stillness.
from the stillness and the silence. Well, openness. Mm -hmm. That sense of openness and warmth and the heart and the mind may just naturally blossom, expand and extend. an openness that can keep opening and opening and opening, feeling it above us and below us, all around, an openness within, the own, within our own mind and heart. This openness is sometimes described as luminous, vast, expansive. Notice how it feels in the mind, heart, and body. It's not the absence of phenomena or sensory experience. It's just more and more space around all those phenomena and sensory experiences. Not getting fixated or stuck anywhere. with the body, speech and mind in their natural states, stillness, silence, and openness. Just noticing or inviting a sense of connecting to the warmth within, a sense of maybe just okayness, maybe some sense of sweetness or goodness, not contrived or generated, just the natural state of our being. Always, already, okay. Let's entertain that possibility for a moment, that it's always, already, okay. 
on that deepest level, whether you call it okayness, Buddha nature, the heart of gold, feel or imagine the possibility of the presence of that quality here and now. Maybe there's just a flicker of it, just a little sense of warmth, maybe something more radiant, expanding and extending within the heart and the body. Even if it feels effortful, just imagine the presence of that warmth. Maybe the goodness we experienced of ourselves as a child. Touching into this quality of our own goodness might naturally help us feel and recognize the goodness of all beings. Maybe that heart's aspiration to support all beings. Bodhicitta. So natural when we are in our true heart, our true beingness, to feel and recognize the true goodness of other beings and feel that quivering of the heart, that desire that all of us could be free. So in our last moments of practice here together, just feeling, imagining, or sensing the aliveness of that desire to practice on behalf of all beings, including us. Seeing if we can feel that as a living presence within us, not an idea, not a concept. And if it's comfortable, just placing one hand on the heart and connecting with that aspiration. Palpably through the warmth sensation.
Thank you for your practice. Questions, reflections, anything you noticed, maybe for those who did it last week and this week, is there any shift? If it was your first time doing that practice, anything you noticed? And for folks here, we can hand you the microphone and folks online, just raise a hand. Remembering that part of the preciousness of being together is really being able to honor one another and listen to one another, speaking from that kind of deeper place of compassion and listening from that place of compassion. So, and also the generosity of sharing with each other. Harris has a hand up. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I noticed in the session how my breathing kind of changed. Like, mm -hmm. initially, it was very loud and audible, but all of a sudden, it sort of, it kind of got more silent. And mm -hmm. I don't know why that switch happened to the breathing. Maybe it's because I've been practicing more of the, what they call diaphragmatic breathing, or... Mm -hmm. Maybe I just got more used to it, but I did notice that change midway into session today, and I found that interesting. Nice. And and did it um did it feel like it was associated with kind of being more easeful or present in any way? It felt like I was a more present, or I could hear more of my surroundings again. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting um, on retreat, sometimes when you're in more sustained practice, your breathing becomes really loud and you're like, no way. Is this how my breath always sounds? It gets a little intimidating and scary, but um, what was being described is also really natural that our, our breathing rate might kind of become a little more smooth, a little more gentle in our practice. And maybe we become more even aware of what's happening around us. That's great. Other reflections, questions? Yes. I started getting a hint of this last week when this was when we're doing this practice of that, um, you know, usually it feels like I'm, there's something like I'm observing thoughts and I'm observing feelings. So there's something like me and there's this thing. And then I was starting with the stillness and uh, spaciousness. It was sort of like, I was getting a feeling that there was something before that. Mm. It was almost like the, the image that came to mind was almost like that it was a, a white canvas mm. that, 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 that and then all of these thoughts and identities and such were sort of <laughs> being written on yeah. the canvas that they were yeah. sort of but that the canvas sort of happened first or yeah. that there was some blank space or mm -hmm. open space that happened before that that all of this that I'm not observing but I've sort of just more have a sense of it yes of, like behind me or around me or yeah. something but I and so it was just um um it was just really intriguing yeah and it um yeah, I think before when I had that kind of what you'd call the sort of a groundlessness mm -hmm. thing, it was a little bit more disorienting. Yes. Like this, but this is more like just sort of a sense of solidity and, mm. and um, yeah, just that it was just there. It was already there. Mm. It's always been there. It's just there. Mm. And there's nothing that I sort of can say about it. It's sort of like, so I don't know if it'll talk about itself or, or, yeah. or if it'll have anything to say, but it just, it was a new kind of um, 
opening, I guess. Yeah. And um, can I ask you a question? Um, you said it was compelling. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that? I mean, I'm, I guess it's not like a compelling, like, I want to do an interview, but like, <laughs> like, what is, what does that feel like? Um, it just feels like that there's a, like a vista in a certain mm. way and that you're sort of, that there's a lot of things going on, but that the vista is what's actually presenting itself rather mm -hmm. than that thing or that thing. So it sort of felt like it, you know, the word, when you asked that question, the word sort of majestic came to mm. mind, sort of yeah, um, compelling in that way that, that approaching something that's kind of like open and um, available and, just presence. Yeah. Yeah. And I assume there was like some bumping in and out of it. Oh yeah. Yeah. But it could, but you could come back and kind of, there was that. Yeah. It's so hard to describe. It didn't feel like I was coming back. It felt like that. Uh -huh. If I could, uh -huh. like if all of this stuff <laughs> would sort of quiet down right. enough, it would sort of be. Yes. Not just visible, there. but sort yeah. of I could feel it yep. in a certain way. So yeah. like it was anything that I had um, it felt like going for volitionally, like trying to yeah. get there was sort of the wrong direction. Yeah. It sort of felt like it's. Yeah. Beautiful. That way. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very trustworthy feeling. Uh -huh. And I think compelling is a really nice word to describe it. Sometimes the word and the words really matter. The words that are described are kind of this absorption that we can feel. It's, I, 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 I have a sense if I'm understanding what you're describing is. There, there's that kind of compelling sense. It's almost like a, I'm a train who's gotten on its tracks, and I'm just, I'm just like in the right direction. Um, and that absorption or that quality of the, it being compelling, and you're like you said, you're not generate, you're not doing, but there's a way it can help you stay without trying. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. And I will say again, cause words matter. You said, you know, the kind of blank or white canvas and that there was a solidity. My guess is you mean maybe stability. Cause when we think of solid, it feels like there's no, it's, it's like not permeable, open or translucent. So just thinking of the words again, so hard, but maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Raging mind with absolutely no clarity, openness. Okay. Um, I had a raging mind with absolutely no clarity at the beginning and um. I, I just felt like there was energy. I was, my mind was kind of going all over the place. And, um, and then I did feel it, it kind of just all of a sudden came that mm. stability, I think is what you were saying. Mm. And that stability then just held me in a place where the, I could find that silence mm. and it felt like it went and I was just like, okay. And then it, it kind of, all of that extra chatter and stuff that was there kind of dissipated and I kind of sat in that place. And I think kind of like what you were saying, it didn't feel like I was um, going there, but it was just there, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't able, I wasn't able to sit with it, I guess, or yeah, be with it. Yes. And so, and then, and then you said the train track thing and that's how it felt. I felt yeah. like, Oh, I was, I'm, I was just there mm -hmm. and I would kind of come, I would, there would be chatter and it would go, yes. go back, but it felt like it was, yeah. I was chugging into that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's very shy, <laughs> that quality, <laughs> right? You yeah. know, easily scared away. Mm -hmm. Not that it goes anywhere, but we go, right? Yeah. 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 So I think it's, but it is really nice to feel it because it is, it's compelling. And I, I do appreciate the absorption word because there is a like, oh, I don't need to go anywhere else. Like mm -hmm. this is... Not that it's full of anything, but there's like, I could just be here. Oh, this is like, I don't know. And, <laughs> the and, words. Then, and, so and also then when you were talking us through the sort of leaning into that openness, that's mm -hmm. when I start feel that happening. Yeah. So it's just yeah. kind of, it was like the series of things that were happening. That yeah. Led to that part. Beautiful. 
Yeah, really grateful for Wong Gil Rinpoche. I'll have to let him know that we are enjoying his instructions. Anybody else? Oh, I see a hand again, or maybe the same hand, just still us. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, same person again. So that's me. I, I, I want to bring this up as a point. I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but this is a session that I'm doing like online over Zoom. And I do feel, I've always noticed a subtle difference doing the meditation in person versus online. And I'm kind of, sometimes I'm wondering why that effect is the way it is as well. Like, I, I feel like I'm more focused, like, in the in the presence of the room versus in an online setting. I don't know if this happens yeah. to anyone else. Yes, I think it happens to many of us, um, though, when we were all online in the pandemic for a while, we forgot. Did you guys know that? Like, when we had to start coming into stuff, and I was like, oh, this is horrible. I want to be with my cat. <laughs> on my couch was <laughs> in person things it's boring um but what you know there's a lot of really interesting contributing factors to that so when we're in literal physical presence there's just a lot more sensory input so i i remember it's so creepy but i remember the first time we sat together i was like oh, i can hear everybody breathe but i like love it like it's so sensorily like like, oh, I want to hear that breath. I just think there's something so mammalian about like hearing each other breathe, right? And that kind of helps us attune. And, and I've said this, especially in the last couple of weeks, that part of what allows us to drop into practice is that we can feel some, some sense of safety and trust in our environment. And we as humans, we emotionally regulate each other. So it can help us kind of drop in a bit more. And a lot of those sensory cues, you know, like there's sounds and there's movement and it's, it's, it's more, it's more of a enriched environment. And um, yeah, I mean, I think online live is, is really a good approximation. The real difference I notice is online, you know, watching a recording. And there's almost a bit of the social accountability there too, right? So here, if someone got up and, you know, went and got a burrito and came back and eat it, like that's uh, inappropriate, right? But if you were like doing your meditation at home, you're like, oh, I'm actually hungry. <laughs> and you go to the kitchen, you know, no one is there. So there's also that like accountability uh, that's really helpful that we provide for each other. Yeah. Yeah, and there's probably like hormones and all sorts of other stuff. And there's there's also just that, um, you know, again, this is in person and online as opposed to recorded, but that we actually make it happen. Like all of us have five or six other things we could be doing, including just like being in bed because it's so dark out. And like that choice to be here motivates the practice too. So thank you. Yeah. I had an interesting experience um, when I don't remember what, where in the meditation it was, but something about being in the body hmm. and it, I kind of uh, went a little bit into the vastness, I think specifically related to a meditation that we did a few weeks ago, something about openness. Hmm. And that was where, I felt very, very connected. Mm. And that was just interesting for me because I was like, well, I don't necessarily know if I'm in my body right now because it was a feeling of, um, sounds kind of woo, woo, but it's, it, it was a feeling of like me really like physically connected with like the physical world. Mm. And in a way that actually felt more grounded to me mm -hmm. than just then uh, like a corporeal, is that a word? Mm -hmm. Experience. It's beautiful. This is a very woo-woo safe space, by the way. We all agree we can come here and be as woo as we want to be. 
Um, yeah, but I, I really know what you're, what you're just, or I don't know if I know, but I, I can kind of feel what you're describing and, um, you know, it's interesting just to like nerd out a tiny bit in, in the contemplative science, like the studying of consciousness, they created like a whole distinct paradigm for how to study consciousness with these modern tools of neuroscience. And we could get really off track and think we just want to look at what's going on in the brain and what's lighting up in the brain. And this contemplative model, so beautiful, describes that mind is like between us. It's not in here. It's not like it is actually this dynamic kind of Hmm. it's called inactive, extended, embodied, right? Just whole, oh, it's an, used in education a lot too, right? The 4E model. Well, yes, and there's actually like, um, specifically some people who are working in very in innovative ways, kids on the autism spectrum. Yes. Are looking at that specifically as a different way of being. Yes, yes. And it is, it is, you know, Hmm. I don't want to like say like true, but there is an authentic, there's an authenticness to the interbeing, to the feeling of being, you know, not just here in this body. But I think what also you're describing is a more present, like a more saturated presence, a more saturated quality of presence, that sense of really feeling connected to the world, which is interesting. Because I think when sometimes when we really find our attention awareness kind of in the body, like really rested in the body, we feel everywhere, which is kind of strange, but like we are more present to what's happening. We're more kind of um Yeah, we're more here in a way, which isn't just necessarily here. It's interesting because, you know, um, in psychedelics, they use the term expanded states of consciousness, which I wish in meditation research, we would have said that first because <laughs> I want to claim it because it, it feels expanded state. I think it's such a beautifully descriptive word from when we're, you know, no longer confined by the consciousness that's associated with thinking and doing, which is a really great use of, con it's great, we need it. But when, you know, the canvas gets bigger, um, it really feels expanded in this funny way. Um, I don't know if that's at all descriptive, but it, it's just beautiful. And I would also say like, it's very trustworthy feeling to kind of follow too. And I know, especially in, in some of our conversations around practice and it's like what it means to be established in the body and to have that like living experience of it. Very beautiful. Yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Please. Uh, I just really appreciated the invitation to stand up and mm. the analogy of the uh, string tautness. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm a number of the meditations here, especially because they're late at night, my strings have been very loose. And I think uh, <laughs> I have my posture that I'm used to, and that is the one that I sit with in the morning, and it feels like this is the way I should do it. Yes. And I need to sort of, there's definitely a like, let me just push through this, and it's weird to stand up. And so I appreciated the invitation to do that, because I was definitely asleep for a significant part of the practice, um, and then kind of noticed that and just stood up and leaned against the wall. And that was interesting to be with that, discomfort of like this mm. is weird and different uh but also really got some benefit and finding some of that mm. kind of basic goodness in the midst of that yeah weird different situation yeah so that's that's just a really helpful analogy of like are are the strings at the right hotness and being okay uh adjusting them yeah 
Wonderful. Yeah. And I do think um, for those of us who are disciplined in our practice and we know how it should be like, wow, it is so powerful <laughs> to do it like in the wrong way or in the way we don't do, normally do it. It's very good to kind of challenge ourselves. I will say, unfortunately, it is not a uh, Buddha sanctioned practice to lean against the wall, though. <laughs> The standing, the standing practice is standing, which makes it pretty unpleasant, I have to say. But I know. I, I don't wonder what should I, what, what is sort of a popular. Point. Yeah, I mean, I think for for me, you know, I actually I tend to go here with hands on the belly, but some people will go like hands behind. I just think it's your physiology and what makes your shoulders hurt the least. Yeah. Um, if I'm sitting retreat, I'll actually wrap like a sarong and just have my, cause then I can stand for quite a while. Um, cause I, I mean, you get so tired. If you're practicing a lot. And I assume like walking would be the strong. Oh, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. I mean, not loudly with like a wallet chain or yeah, yeah, no stomping, yeah, yeah. I think that's a nice that's a nice possibility. And like you know, in the ideal world, we would all come here not after having eaten dinner and having taken just like a nice brisk walk, right? Or, but it's um yeah, I think working with working with you know what can support us is is great. So. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Yeah, right. So no trampoline meditation. Ooh. After dinner, sorry. Yeah, that just sounds hard. I want to say I was very grateful for the, um, for the pills because I appreciate a, in a lot of the meditations, the let the thoughts go through, hope that they will slowly... Try not to hope. The hoping is a thought, I know. But anyway, try to let them kind of um, do their thing. But one thing I really appreciated about this one was the way it helped to explicitly kind of turn turn the volume down. Mm. Sometimes in these meditations, I feel like we start the meditation. It's like, all right, you're, you're, you better have turned them down already. So now you're ready. And I felt like having more time to do that... Mm um was really helpful for me and it's funny because often i come here with very like big wishy-washy thoughts and a very concrete thing on my mind which was a very adhd day and was rushing to eat dinner before i came here and um and as soon as i sat down i was like did i leave the burner on <laughs> oh man and it was one of those things where on the one hand, like knowing I had the burner on would be the worst thought. And a lot of the time, that's what these thoughts feel like. Mm. It's like, I know the burner is on. The thought is here. I can't get it out of my head. But it made me ponder that a lot of the thoughts that often get in the way of this practice for me are more the, I, I don't know if the thought is happening, mm. but then it comes back in. Did, did, I, did I finish the thought? Mm. And then just that thought brings the thought back. It's mm. almost the deliberate practice of going, no, I remember turning it off is kind of what I felt like hmm. this practice helped me do. Hmm. Sweet. And so I appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, we did it of course on the half day too. So it's like getting that momentum there. And I really hope you didn't leave the burner on. <laughs> After the meditation, I was like, no. Um, but yeah, like whatever it takes to have that sense that we can have a little reprieve from the constant barrage. Um, but yeah, it can be really, it can be really hard to transition out of our everyday into the sitting, which is why, you know, as, as extra homework, it's so amazing to do many moments of awareness throughout the day, just like 30 seconds, 90 seconds, really, if, you know, if this is feeling enjoyable, then stillness, silence, openness, it's right there. So to just try that throughout the day. So then there's kind of a a little bit of a reflex being built. It's, it's very effective. Oh, thank you. 
Yes. Well, I was on the half day as well. Mm -hmm. And the last week and then to do it again this week, and those, kind of those three things uh, were stillness, <laughs> silence, and, and openness. Yeah. Because I feel like I had just a delightful, just a blissful breakthrough mm -hmm. tonight. I always come mm -hmm. away feeling kind of blissed out uh but it's got real world mm. application mm. you know i basically just did a trust fall with the universe with my career recently mm. and now i'm kind of having this sensation of you know how you walk into a room and you're like what 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 why am i here what am i what am i doing in this room this is the way I feel about my freaking career. <laughs> but then coming here and sitting, it's like, oh, no, I don't have to do or say or be mm. anything. It's just it's just happening, mm. it's evolving mm. quite organically. Yeah, beautiful. Wow. That's wonderful. Yeah, a little bit of... Um, relaxation ease presence can really feel like we're being held right like actually supported so i can imagine that coming through too yeah this idea that we have to control every moment of our experience in order to be okay and then in meditation we're kind of being asked to not not control we want to direct and guide but we also let be it's a very different quality than we're usually bringing to how we navigate and orient through our life yes there's another hand hi there i think you're muted there we go oh, I, there we go um so i just wanted to mention that um I appreciate the comment about the difference between online and in person and your comment about your cat, because I started <laughs> meditating um, during, I was studying for a while before then, but I started meditating in earnest during the pandemic. Mm. And I, I've only um, sat with other humans in the same room, like mm, maybe once or twice. And I, it's kind of like allowed me to, as I'm getting back to regular life, I've done some extended like online at home um, retreats, but I'm kind of intimidated <laughs> about it. And especially when I hear people talk about like long retreats um, and I'm like, man, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't want other people to be annoyed by you know, something that I'm doing or whatever. I'm not worried about doing the, the work, um, but it has allowed me to kind of seamlessly go from practice to regular life um, in that way. So there's not really a big difference there. But then you said, I encourage you to challenge yourself <laughs> in your practice. So, um, I kind of just, I just wanted to mention that in case there's others maybe that are feeling that way, but um, because it's coming up, it keeps coming up and that's probably because it's time to go sit with other humans. Yeah, where do you live? <laughs> I'm in Seattle. Okay, so it's a little far for you to get here. But, yeah, but I do want to come down there. Um, I do um, Thursday mornings with someone at Spirit Rock, and I study with Michael um, a lot. And so it's calling me. So, but right. there's lots of opportunity here. I just, there's been other things that keep me from going um, in, to do in person stuff, and in online is just so convenient and i look forward to coming here with this group every week so much so Aww. it's great to have you and I, I do think online can offer a great refuge and i truly believe you know um you said seamlessly between meditation and life but i do think when we are kind of pushed into the presence of being with others and on retreat like wow there's nothing like 
noticing where you still need to wake up on the path to like, why do they breathe like that? Or, you know, like all of our issues are like, why are they looking at me? Like our self-consciousness, our, our judgments, our frustrations, like until we can really see each and every one of us as a Buddha, like we need the training of being with others. Like it helps yeah. to, to be I'm there. so, so to reluctant to get out of my comfort zone too. And, you know, I know that about myself. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Take allowed care. me to no. stay in my cocoon for maybe a little too long. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing as, um, you know, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's this, it, it sounds worse in, in contemporary terms, but this, there is a practice of confession and not like I did something wrong, but like, I want to change or shift or improve. So I appreciate you sharing that with us of like, okay, I want to try this. So we're here holding that with you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have eight minutes to do a little bit of the reading, so let's let's cruise through. Um, I did want to. I wanted to come back to this um, this first quote I read about the living presence of the Dharma. So there's a little story here of these two uh, these two monks, and they're brothers, and they're from a kind of higher caste in India at the time, and they're very well known for their expertise in linguistics and ancient literature. And, you know, they, they went to the Buddha and they said, we would like to speak with you concerning the question of language as it relates to the dissemination of teachings. Buddha, you usually deliver your talks in Magdi, but Magdi is not the native tongue of many monks. And the people in some of the regions um, that the monks teach don't even speak Magdi. Thus, they translate the teaching into local dialects. Before we were ordained, we had the good fortune to study many dialects and languages. It's our observation that the sublime and subtle nuances of your teachings have been hampered by being translated into local dialects and idioms. We would like your permission to render all your teachings into the classical meter of the Vedic language. In all, if all the bhikkhus monks studied and taught the teachings in one language, distortion and error could be avoided. And the Buddha was silent for a moment. And then he said, it would not be beneficial to follow your suggestion. The Dharma is a living reality. The words used, uh, the words used to transmit it, should only be the words used by daily by people. I do not want the teaching to be transmitted in a language that can be understood only by a few scholars. I want my disciples, both ordained and lay disciples, to study and practice the Dharma in their native tongues. That way, the Dharma will remain vital and accessible. The Dharma must be applicable to present life and compatible with local culture. Um, and I just, I love that idea and, you know, he didn't even want it written down, right. Just through these repeated, um, uh, different suttas that's, but this idea that it really has to have an aliveness and the word should have an aliveness for us. And I think it's a good, you know, words are so tough and these concepts like emptiness and, uh, signlessness and aimlessness, like we talked about last week they can feel a little archaic um, and, and difficult. So finding the approximation of words that work for us just feels like so important. Um, and I thought, yeah, I think it's a nice idea to really kind of come up with the words in your practice that describe your experience, you know, not to let go completely of the teachings and their structures, but to really have that. Like, I think, you know, for me, like the way I think about emptiness is just remembering that nothing is fixed and not to get fixated, right? That's like a much like more alive version of the teaching for me. Um, and I think it's, it's useful to try to translate these words back into language. that makes sense to us as opposed to just taking it as it is. So I'm really into us creating our own Dharma language and dialogue. So open for all suggestions, if there are words you think um, make more sense. And, you know, this part here, 
it's like small passage, but just don't make it hard to don't make it hard to understand. Don't make it academic and scholarly. Don't put it in your beautiful uh, linguistic tools upon it. Let it be plainly spoken, even if it's kind of hampering the beauty, like let it be natural and free. I really appreciate that. And this next story uh, that, that comes up, and this comes up a number of times, but there are many of these different, especially kind of scholars and ascetics who want to talk to the Buddha about metaphysical questions. So this is um, a little bit of a description of why he doesn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. One day during a rainstorm, an ascetic named Utia came to visit the Buddha. He was invited to sit down and was offered... Um, a seat right before the Buddha, and he asked the Buddha, is the world eternal or will it one day perish? The Buddha smiled and said, with your consent, I will not answer to that question. <laughs> and then Utaya asked, is the world finite or infinite? I will not ask that question either. Well then, are the body and spirit one or two? I will not answer that question either. After you die, will you continue to exist or not? This question too, I will not answer. <laughs> or perhaps you hold that after death, you will neither continue to exist nor cease to exist. Ascetic Utaya, I'm sorry, I will not answer that question either. Utaya looked confused. He said, you've refused to answer every question I've asked. What question will you answer? The Buddha replied, I will only answer questions that pertain directly to the pra practice of gaining mastery over one's mind and body in order to overcome all sorrows and anxieties. He then asks, Utaya asks, how many people in the world do you think your teaching can save? The Buddha just sat silently. The ascetic Utaya said no more, and sensing that he felt the Buddha didn't want to answer him or wasn't able to. Ananda, who was there, took pity on the man and spoke up. He said, Ascetic Utaya, perhaps this example will help you better understand the teacher's intent. Imagine a king who dwells in a strongly fortified palace, surrounded by a wide moat and a wall. There is one entrance and one exit to the palace guarded day and night. The vigilant guard will allow only persons he knows into the palace. No one else is granted permission to enter. The guard has furthermore made a careful check of the palace wall to make sure there are no gaps or cracks, big enough for even a kitten to squeeze through. The king sits on his throne without concern for how many people enter the palace. He knows the guard will prevent all unwelcome guests from entering. It is similarly for the Buddha. He's not concerned with the number of people who follow his way. He is concerned only with teaching the way, which has the capacity to dissolve greed, violence, and delusion, so that those who follow the way can realize peace, joy, and liberation. Ask my teacher questions about how to master mind and body, and he will surely answer you. The ascetic Utaya understood, but he was still entangled in the questions of a metaphysical nature, so he asked no more, and he departed feeling somewhat unsatisfied. But this idea that, you know, the Buddha isn't interested in, like, he wants to fortify, or, like, create this kind of protection, this guardianship of mind, heart, and body. He's not, he's not preoccupied with these metaphysical questions. Not mentioned much in Thich Nhat Hanh's description, but in many other descriptions of attained masters, especially in Tibet, they do attain what are called these cities or these special powers. You can believe it or not, but some of these uh, are associated with being able to really have insight into the true nature of the universe. So all these ascetics are asking Buddha because they really think he knows. And it's possible that he knows. Right, that his depth of being able to see so clearly the dependent co-arising of everything allows him to really see you know, the full kind of arc of the universe. But he has no interest in talking on these matters because it will not help people and it'll only get them ensnared. And I, I was thinking about that, kind of what that is like, um, our obsession with ideas and concepts. He says, um, the Buddha kind of continues to say, 
um, the teachings on emptiness or self are meant to guide our meditation. It's not taken as not to be taken as a doctrine like one way. If people take it as a doctrine, they'll become entangled by it. I've often said that the teaching should be considered as a raft to cross to the other shore or a finger pointing at the moon. We shouldn't be caught in the teaching. And I, I kind of think about this a little bit in how much we can get caught up in the idea of like, you know, even things like self-help practices, right? We forget that the purpose of them is so that we can be, you know, more available for ourselves and others. And we start to kind of obsess, quantify. Uh, I, I know that um, it can be really appealing to do so, but it can really get in the way. And it's, this is not a metaphysical entanglement. This is a very corporeal self-obsession but it has the same kind of kind of feeling of why do you care so much about all of these specifics when you know the true goal or the true hope is to liberate the mind heart and body and be available for others so i just um appreciating the buddha kind of not not showing off not wanting to be the most important and the most all-knowing but really to focus on what will liberate us felt inspiring to me so we'll come back um yeah next week might be one of our last weeks of old path white clouds i know it's been like 12 months, at least nine months. What is time? Um, but that'll be, yeah, that'll be really sweet um, to kind of see the Buddha through his final days and some of the intrigue around that, which happens of his students who want more power and kind of how he manages those very human challenges and difficulties. So... Let's take a moment and dedicate our practice here together. So regathering our attention and awareness into the mind, heart, and body. Just flashing for a moment under that feeling of stillness, silence, openness. And if it feels comfortable, placing hands together in front of the heart as a gesture of offering and opening. And dedicating any benefit of our time here together, dedicating the energy, the intention, and the care towards this outrageous and beautiful aspiration that all beings could be healthy and strong. All beings could know their true nature all beings could be free. Thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone for the wonderful shares and comments. I, I think you all know we are a volunteer run center. Please support your center. It'd be really helpful for us to keep the doors open, keep this place going on.